y'all, Scott here. Ooh, look at me, I'm the Nintendo Switch. I sold over 32 million units. Yeah, big whoop. Uh, how many units did the human race sell? Hmm, try 7 billion units. That's right, f*** you, Nintendo. Oh, hey, it's been two years. The Nintendo Switch is two years old, only 23 years until it can rent a car. Now, three days after the Switch officially released, I talked about my opinions on the system at that point in time. One year after the Switch officially released, I talked about my opinions on the system at that point in time, and I think we all know where I'm going with this. I'm gonna complain about Mario Tennis Aces and talk about year two of the Nintendo Switch. I'll be taking a look back at the Switch's second full year on the market month by month, from March 2018 to February 2019. I'll be talking about the main games that released each month and the news that came out. As with last year, I'll primarily be focusing on the games I played and or the more notable games on the system. So buckle up, let's see how long it takes me to start whining. Kirby Star Allies wasn't what I wanted! March was a pretty busy month, all things considered. The only first party Nintendo title that shot onto store shelves was Kirby Star Allies, and oh boy. Kirby Star Allies was Kirby's first traditional mainline game in HD. So I guess they wanted this one to be as basic Kirby as basic Kirby can be. Star Allies isn't a bad game, but even when it was originally revealed at E3 2017, I championed the opinion that it looked too basic. Fast forward to March 2018, and oh man, do I have an opinion for you. Star Allies is focused on co-op multiplayer, and because of that, level designs are incredibly simplistic to accommodate for it. Now, Kirby games are generally pretty simple, but this one took things too far in my opinion. These levels rarely have anything of note in them. No fun stage gimmicks or ideas or themes, nothing. And calling the puzzles in this game puzzles is an insult to puzzles everywhere. Sure, this makes the game more accessible for multiplayer. Uh, complex 2D platformer levels can be a nightmare for co-op. But even then, playing in multiplayer doesn't make the game that much more interesting. Now I love a good Kirby game, I've enjoyed every game before Star Allies that used this same gameplay style. This one just did not do it for me, I'm sorry. Like I said, it isn't bad. I know tons of people who had a good time with it, but it seems like even the people who enjoyed it say this definitely isn't Kirby's finest outing. Not worth the $60 price tag, that's for sure. At least at launch. Star Allies received a handful of free updates throughout the year, adding new playable characters from previous Kirby games and a bunch of new things like an extra mode. Yeah, that's cool, but I'd rather these things be in the game from the start simply because by the time they were added, I was long past the point of caring about Star Allies. The game already kind of burned me with its lack of content and overall gameplay. Plus, guys, yeah, they added a ton of characters and some of them are awesome callbacks to old school Kirby games. But the lack of playable characters wasn't my problem with Star Allies, so while I guess they give the game more worth, it's nothing that's really gonna change my opinion. In terms of other games from March, Scribblenaut Showdown came out and it was a triumphant return of the Scribblenauts franchise, never mind. I was somewhat intrigued by this game when it was first announced. Uh, Scribblenauts party game sounds pretty fun, but after seeing one trailer and reading reviews, I kinda manically ran away. The original Punch-Out arcade game finally got a re-release through the Arcade Archive series, which was cool to see. A lot of people were talking about that indie game Mulaka. I didn't play it, my eyes were mainly on bingo for Nintendo Switch. Fear Effect Senna, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse, Toki Tori, yeah, there was definitely stuff to play, but not the greatest overall month in terms of games. What made March worth it was the Nintendo Direct on March 8th. Honestly, one of the better directs in recent memory. So much was shown. Okami HD, Sushi Striker was announced for Switch, Project Octopath Traveler was renamed to, get this, Octopath Traveler. Dark Souls got an amiibo and was confirmed for a May 25th release day, can't wait for that. A Captain Toad Treasure Tracker re-release, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, Splatoon 2 got paid DLC, and holy sh**. Yeah, Smash Brothers was announced for the Switch. I wasn't expecting that to happen during this Direct, but right when we saw both Koizumi and the Splatoon producer standing together, I gave off a hearty, oh yeah, Smash Brothers is about to be announced with Inklings as playable characters. Oh, what do you look at that? Later in March, a Nindy Showcase premiered. It detailed a bunch of indie games, but it was only 10 minutes long, so that was pretty disappointing. Some solid stuff in there, definitely, though. Luminous Remastered and Mark of the Ninja, just to name two. March also marked the first time the My Nintendo Rewards program actually meant something. Starting this month, if you were a My Nintendo member, you could build up gold points by spending money on the eShop and then redeem those points for a certain amount of cash you could use on digital games. Yeah, I'm happy this is here. Sometimes I'll be buying a game digitally and go, oh man, I can use some of my gold points to pay for this. <laughs> you have to spend a lot of money to get even a little bit of cash back through the gold points. A $60 game will net you three bucks back. That's not a ton. Again, I'm happy it's here, but Nintendo sure ain't running a charity. April was another eh month in terms of games. Again, there were definitely things to play, just nothing huge came out. This was the month of Nintendo Labo. It was initially revealed earlier in January, and I thought this concept was absolutely brilliant. Giving you cardboard and instructing you on how to make your own Switch accessories to play mini games, using the Joy-Con to help make these things function, one of the most creative things Nintendo's come up with in recent memory. It's obviously aimed towards kids, specifically those with an interest in creativity or engineering, but I think plenty of us looked at it and said, yeah, this is pretty cool in general. 
The first two kits released on April 20th, haha. Uh -huh. Toy-Con 1, the Variety Kit, and Toy-Con 2, the Robot Kit. I just picked up the Variety Kit and almost a full year later and I still haven't touched these things since. I didn't dislike Labo, but there just wasn't much to it if you weren't looking to customize and make your own Labo creations. The build process was a ton of fun, I like that, but afterwards there was just nothing to do with these things. The games offered in Labo are beyond shallow, there's just nothing to them. You play around with them for 10 minutes and that's about it. I wasn't expecting anything I'd be playing for hours, but more so expecting something along the lines of a mini game in Wii Play or something. Like sure, those aren't massive games, but they're quick short bursts of fun, they're enjoyable to replay for a high score. I wish they just added a time attack or arcade mode to these games. They have promise, they just weren't presented in ways that made them fun or replayable. I already took a look at the Labo Variety Kit before, my opinions haven't really changed. It's a really awesome concept, and it's more about the journey than the destination. Building these things is half the enjoyment, and the most memorable experience I had with Labo. And if that doesn't interest you, for God's sake, stay away. After I built them all, there's nothing to do. I didn't have any interest in going into the Toy-Con garage to program my own Labo toys. All the games I was done with after 30 minutes, Nintendo Labo in its initial state was made for a very specific kind of kit, one that wanted to make their own machines, one that was going to get a lot of use out of the Toy-Con garage feature, but it could have been for so many more people if they made the games more replayable and fun. As it stands, these are overpriced and take up too much room considering how much use I got out of them. The robot kit doesn't seem much better at all. You get one robot suit, which sounds kind of cool, and the game portion of it seems more in-depth than anything in the variety kit, but it's $10 more and there's less you can do with the robot. The variety kit offers a lot more and lends itself to customization. What the hell are you gonna do with this thing? Other than Labo, Don't Starve, South Park, and Shelter Generations came out, am I the only one who can't tell if this game's visual style is kinda cool looking or kinda ugly? Sega confirmed they were bringing over their classic games to Nintendo Switch via the Sega Ages label, and Dark Souls Remastered got delayed to summer 2018, while the other platforms would get it in May as originally promised. Yes, the platforms where they actually had to up Dark Souls were getting the game first, while the platform that's more in line with the original consoles Dark Souls released on was getting it later, that made sense. Now May was a fantastic month for regurgitation. Nintendo re-released two Wii U games for the Switch, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, and Hyrule Warriors. Now let me first state my opinion on Wii U ports of games. Many are for them, many are against them. I'm in the middle. I love that they happen because people who didn't play these games originally can finally play them, and I love that they allow me to play good Wii U games on a platform that isn't the Wii U. However, it annoys me when Nintendo overprices Wii U ports, when they try to pass them off as new games, when they're the only thing Nintendo releases for like two months, we'll get to you later. Ports aren't fun for everybody. They have some merit, but they can be annoying. But hey, at least Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is one of the greatest platformers ever crafted, so that's one point in its favor. This game is godlike. It is so good. Why is it $60? Tropical Freeze released in 2014 for $50. And then in 2016 was permanently reduced to $20 via Nintendo Select, so please explain to me why this version with one new character added four years later is $60. I'm not saying that if Tropical Freeze was a brand new game in 2018, it wouldn't be worth $60. But it's four years old. And Nintendo officially valued the game at $20 up until the Switch port was announced, so I don't think there's much of an excuse here. They were pulling a fast one on us with this game's price. I kind of think Nintendo forgot they originally priced Tropical Freeze at $50 on the Wii U, because Captain Toad originally retailed for $40, and lo and behold, it retailed for that on the Switch too. Oh, well, Tropical Freeze is great, and definitely worth it if you never played it. But I picked it up on sale a few months later. I already beat it on Wii U, I didn't need it right away, and I usually do that with the Wii U ports. Wait for a sale at a later date. Which is exactly what I did with Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. Now, this was also $60, but I'm personally more okay with this price point than I was with Donkey Kong. This game includes all the DLC from the Wii U version, all the characters and gameplay changes from the 3DS version, and all the DLC from that version as well, plus extra little bonuses like Breath of the Wild costumes. This truly is the Definitive Edition, and is quite a good deal all things considered. Now, I've never been a huge Hyrule Warriors guy. I enjoy my time with it on the Wii U, but didn't play for hundreds of hours like others did. However, I still think it's a fun, shut your brain off kind of game. Just mow down enemies with tons of Zelda fan service. The timing of this port was weird to me though. The Fire Emblem Warriors just came out in October, and that game kind of came and went, so instead of trying to give that game more exposure, Nintendo just revealed Hyrule Warriors for the Switch, which I'm sorry Fire Emblem fans, is way more appealing and interesting to most people than Fire Emblem Warriors, even if it is a four-year-old game. Both original Mega Man Legacy collections released. I love that these games are on Switch, but I would have preferred for it if they combine them into a Mega Man Ultimate Legacy Collection rather than sell both of them separately. Another Capcom collection released the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection and oh my god this thing includes so many Street Fighters and it retail for the same price as Ultra Street Fighter 2 retail for a year ago. Well, what's going on here? This has 12 games on it including 5 Street Fighter 2s and Ultra Street Fighter 2 has 1 Street Fighter 2. Please explain that $40 price point. While some of the biggest releases in May were just older games, the month still had some solid original titles. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was a surprise release. It was developed by Inti crates and was a precursor to the upcoming Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, 
uh, while that game plays like a Metroidvania style Castlevania game, Curse of the Moon plays just like the classic Castlevania titles on the NES, and I gotta be honest, Curse of the Moon looked way more appealing to me. I did pick this one up. Yoku's Island Express though, I haven't yet. This was a big one for a lot of people, being a pinball adventure game. I'm definitely still interested in trying this one out. Runner 3 finally released too, but I have to say, this visual style just does not do anything for me. I do have Runner 3, I got it on sale, but haven't played any of these games yet. I did play Ikaruga though, which is one of the greatest 2D shoot 'em ups of all time. It's harder than hard, but it's just so good. But we can't forget the biggest game Capcom announced for the Switch, Resident Evil 7! What?! Cloud Edition! What? Capcom randomly announced and released Resident Evil 7. This game came out in 2017 for PS4 and Xbox One, and I personally never imagined it would run on Switch. Well, it was sorta right, because this game requires an internet connection at all times. It's streamed to the console, uh, this way they can just run the game on much more powerful hardware, stream it to the Switch, and bada boom, you have yourself the worst possible way to play Resident Evil 7. I have to admit though, this was a fairly creative way to get a crazy demanding game like this running on the system without redoing everything and putting a lot of development time into a port. Now, this only released in Japan, and we have yet to get a fully cloud-based multi-platform game in this style here in North America. It's still just really weird this even happened. Well, I said, yeah, this was a creative solution to get the game on Switch. I don't want to see this happen all too much. Having an internet connection required for single-player games is really annoying, and it makes it almost impossible to play these things on the go which is what the Switch is best known for. Nintendo also started to offer a Switch bundle without the dock in Japan, coming in at $50 cheaper than the regular bundle, well that's fucking stupid. Docks retail for $90, plus you don't even get the charging cable with this bundle. I get this is a Japan exclusive thing, but man, why would you buy this? Sure, plenty of people play their Switch predominantly in handheld mode, but you are literally getting ripped off by buying a dockless bundle. The Pokemon Company also finally gave everybody what they wanted, the official announcement for Pokemon on the Switch, the first traditional Pokemon title on a console. And what they they announced were games that gave a lot of people a case of the what the hells. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee were full remakes of Pokemon Yellow on the Game Boy, with a lot of elements from Pokemon Go present. This was definitely a bit surprising, and not what a lot of Pokemon fans wanted. They wanted a full on new game, one that didn't look this simple, or one that wasn't so focused on the first generation of Pokemon, or one that didn't look like a console version of Pokemon Go. This game was primarily meant for different people. Lapsed Pokemon fans, people who loved it before but fell out of it, people who liked Pokemon Go but never really played a real Pokemon game, or people who just never played Pokemon. Hey, it's me, Scott. I think this was a smart game for them to make, and they did confirm that a true mainline traditional Pokemon game would come in 2019. So really, it wasn't a huge deal. Fans were still getting a main title. They also announced and released Pokemon Quest for the eShop, a free title that literally just felt like a garbage mobile game they shoehorned onto the Switch. That's exactly what it is. I downloaded this and played it for two minutes and said, yeah, I'm not into this. Nintendo finally disclosed more details on their upcoming paid online service for the Switch, Nintendo Switch Online. This thing kept on getting delayed and delayed, but they finally were able to shed some light on it. Nintendo revealed that their online service would not only force people to pay for online multiplayer, but offer cloud saves for certain games and a selection of 20 NES games to play online with more added every month. NSO was initially met with relative positivity. Uh, people were excited to have cloud saves, old Nintendo games on the Switch, and just actual details on the surface in general. But after thinking about the service more and more, things got more critical. Cloud saves are locked behind the online service? That NES games app meant no virtual console? That smartphone voice chat app isn't going away? It wouldn't launch until September, but people were already critiquing this service before it even came out. The great month of E3. Nintendo was ready to let it all out with an E3 2018 Nintendo Direct on June 12th, and for all you non-Smash Brothers fans, I am so sorry. Yeah, that wasn't that great. Uh, Smash Brothers ended the Direct, as in the last 30 minutes of a 45 minute presentation were dedicated to it. Smash Brothers Switch was revealed to be Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, including every character from Smash Brothers history and a wealth of gameplay changes. I freaked out, this was amazing. But outside of Smash Brothers, which looked great, this presentation blew. They started things off with the reveal of Damon X Machina, a game everybody in 2019 refers to as, oh yeah, that game exists. This has got to be one of the most forgettable games Nintendo has ever revealed. It doesn't look bad, but they present it so poorly every time they show it off. Like, why start E3 off with this mech game with a title most people don't know how to pronounce? I always say I guess it looks good, but I don't really know what this game is gonna play like. I don't really know exactly what I'm looking at most of the time. And then they went on to show off the standalone Xenoblade 2 expansion. Like, why cold open showing these two games first? These aren't like immediate crowd pleasers. These are fine games and all, but they're pretty niche. You'd think throwing them in the middle of the presentation would work better. Moving on, Super Mario Party was officially unveiled in the presentation. Mario Party isn't a crazy amazing E3 announcement, but it looked like classic Mario. 
Mario Party, which is what the series needed after it did a bunch of stupid fucking shit. Fire Emblem Three Houses was shown off. We knew a Fire Emblem Switch game was in the works for about a year and a half now, so it was nice to finally see it in action. And that's all I have to say because once again, I don't care for Fire Emblem either. Jesus, I probably don't even like video games, right guys? Fortnite released immediately after the presentation, which was pretty big. I mean, it was the hot game, so to have it on Switch was a big deal. I just didn't really care. I've said this before, but Fortnite runs on smartphones. Should a Switch release really be that amazing? Overcooked 2, Hollow Knight, Killer Queen Black, all really cool indie games, and then 30 minutes of Smash Brothers. That was it. Yeah, that was a very underwhelming, lame Nintendo Direct. It was a pretty good Smash Brothers Direct, but a general Nintendo Direct, yeah, that wasn't that great. Switch third-party-wise wasn't the most amazing at E3 either. You'd assume we'd see more support for the console this year, but there wasn't a ton. Fallout Shelter came to the platform into a mobile game, who cares? Trials, Starlink revealed the Star Fox collaboration, which was pretty cool, but other than that, there wasn't much Switch content at E3, surprisingly. Splatoon 2's Octo expansion released during E3, though. I still haven't played it or bought it. Splatoon 2's base single-player campaign was pretty lackluster in my opinion, but from what I've seen, Octo Expansion fixes that and offers a MIDI experience that looks way better. Arcade Archive's Donkey Kong came out during E3 too, which was one of the first times the original arcade ROM of Donkey Kong was re-released, which was pretty cool. They also announced that the ultra-rare Nintendo arcade game Skyskipper would be released via Arcade Archives in July. Outside of E3, Nintendo actually released some games this month, so it was a pretty busy time, all things considered. Mario Tennis Aces pulled a Kirby Star Allies from me. It wasn't a bad game. The core gameplay I'd show here is absolutely phenomenal. Building up the meter in the top left means you can slow down time, use a zone shot, special shot, it makes Mario Tennis way more skill-based than ever before, which is a huge improvement from when Nintendo released body odor on a disc with the last game. However, while Ace's gameplay and visuals are great, Everything else falters, which is weird to say. How can a game have great gameplay, but not be great overall? Well, there's barely anything to do with that great gameplay. You can plow through the adventure mode, which Nintendo really pushed in this game's marketing, and it's nothing special. It just feels like a four hour long time waster and not much else. But that's it with this game. There's no other modes to play other than just playing tennis or playing tennis online. Again, it's weird to say that because it's Mario Tennis. You might ask, what else was I expecting? And just look at all the other Mario Tennis games. These things were packed with fun little extra modes, awesome gimmicky courts, mini games. You could play with Mario Kart-esque items, but in Aces, it's just tennis. And now this game is obviously built off of Ultra Smash from the Wii U. And that game was literally just tennis too, no crazy Mario spin. Just tennis on one type of court. It was as if you had to pay Nintendo 50 bucks for the right to go to hell. At least with Aces, the gameplay is pretty damn solid and it at least has multiple themed courts. I will say though, these courts are pretty lame. Like if they even have gimmicks, they're usually kind of annoying or just straight up boring. Look, I'm on a pirate ship. There's a giant rod in the middle that can sometimes interfere with the ball. Yeah, my favorite court. If all you want from a Mario Tennis game is a tennis game, Mario Tennis Aces delivers but in my opinion, it doesn't have nearly enough to it. While I really appreciate the smart changes to gameplay that really improve the core game, I don't know, I kind of prioritize wacky multiplayer fun in a Mario sports game compared to how smart the gameplay loop is. I'm not necessarily looking for a game with the deepest mechanics when picking up a Mario sports game. Through free updates, Mario Tennis Aces primarily has been adding new characters, and again, like I said with Kirby Star Allies, this game's problems had nothing to do with the lack of playable characters. These updates really don't do much for me. Here's a quote you can smack on the back of the box, Nintendo. The gameplay's good, but the game is not. Now, most people will say the game they played the most in June was Mario Tennis, but the Nintendo published game I played the most in June was none other than... Sushi Striker, The Way of Sushido. Well, this game happened, didn't it? Sushi Striker was originally announced as a 3DS game at E3 2017, but was later revealed to also be coming to Switch day and date with the 3DS version. This is a puzzle game where you just have to link up similar sushi plates, moving on the bell, eat the sushi, and then throw the empty plates at your opponent. I always kept an eye on this game. I thought it would be a fun little puzzle game that looked like it had a lot of heart put into it, and I was kinda right. I was addicted to this game for a few hours, uh, linking up the sushi plates had such a satisfying feel to it, specifically while playing with a controller. While I think using a touchscreen is how it was intended, Tended to be played, I really preferred using the analog stick. Automatically snapping to a plate, it made it crazy fun to link up a ton of them, and the sound effects just made everything crazy enjoyable. And I thought it was really cool how the game featured loads of tongue in cheek cutscenes and dialogue despite being just a puzzle game. It really felt like the developers cared immensely. However, that's kind of where my praises end, because the game just goes on and on and on and doesn't really switch things up. The story mode just feels like you're doing the same thing over and over again. You constantly fight against the same enemies. These guards or whatever appear non-stop, and the visuals barely change at all. It just feels like you're doing the same thing for 10 hours. Sure, some random power-ups are thrown into the mix, but it doesn't help things that much in my opinion. Most of the time, each stage feels the same to the last. Also, while I said I appreciated the cutscenes and the humor, 
At a certain point, I stopped caring. The story wasn't interesting, really. It was more so charming that the game's story didn't take itself seriously and the fact that this game even had a story. But that didn't mean I cared enough to see it through. It just slowed everything down, and honestly, I just started skipping most of the cutscenes. This thing retailed for $50, and oh god, it is not worth even half of that. The 3DS version at least started at $40, but still. Download the demo for it and play that 30 times in a row, and you get the exact same experience as playing the full game, in my opinion. It's a lot of fun for a bit, but it's just the same thing over and over again. Outside of those games, Fortnite and Hollow Knight were some big releases, alongside Inside and Limbo, Shaq Fu, A Legend Reborn happened, Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, uh, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, and Wolfenstein 2 came out on the same day, don't want to get them confused. Both really impressive ports on the Switch. I have Crash and it ran perfectly fine. Of course, it didn't look as good as the other consoles, but by and large, this is the Insane Trilogy. It still looks great, and being able to play the original Crash Bandicoot games remastered on a Nintendo platform is really cool. Now, I haven't played this one yet, but Wolfenstein 2 is more so impressive with just how well they were able to make it work on Switch. This is far from the definitive version of the game, but it's definitely more than playable and looks pretty good, all things considered. Now, the Octo expansion wasn't the only thing to cop DLC. Mario Plus Rabbids actually got a full-blown expansion as well, entitled Donkey Kong Adventure. And from what I've seen, it looks like like so much love and care was crammed into something that should have just been a simple expansion. It's really admirable. But <laughs> whatever, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe got Labo support. I thought, wow, this actually makes my Labo creations useful. And then I realized, never mind, why the hell would I want to do this? July is usually a dead month for new game releases, but Nintendo decided to break conventions as this was the month many's most anticipated Switch title released. Octopath Traveler finally came out. Do you really think I played it? Yeah, I don't really play RPGs if you don't already know. It's not that I'm heavily opposed to them or don't get them. It's simply just far from my favorite genre. I'll still play a game that intrigues me if it's an RPG, it just doesn't happen that much. I will say though that Octopath looks beautiful and so unique. I'd love to see Square Enix make a sequel just because I've seen how so many people adored this game. I mean, it did way better than I think anybody thought it would. There were shortages of it in Japan, it did that well. I'd love to see them put out more of this series or just continue with this art style. On the same day as that game, Nintendo published the re-release of Captain Toad Treasure Tracker and it actually came out on 3DS as well at the same time. Treasure Tracker was a good Wii U game and that's basically all I have to say about it. It's just a fun little concept a game where you have to traverse these 3D puzzle boxes and you can't jump. I didn't pick the Switch version up just yet, mainly because it's not a game I'm particularly dying to replay, but I will eventually if I see it for a good price. However, I'm tempted to say that this isn't the definitive version of Captain Toad. I played the Switch demo and have seen a good amount of footage. It plays perfectly fine on the platform, don't get me wrong, but man, was it way more tailor-made for the Wii U than I remember. So many things in Captain Toad need to be touched via the touchscreen, so playing in TV mode means this pretty annoying cursor is on screen all the time. This isn't a problem in handheld mode, but if you're looking to play on the TV, the original Wii U version feels a bit more natural. Treasure Tracker feels kind of shoehorned onto the Switch to me. It's a bit odd they ported this game to the Switch so early on in its life. I feel a sequel would have been a better fit just because they wouldn't have had to work around all the touchscreen requirements for TV mode. Nintendo also published Go Vacation, a port of some Wii game Bandai Namco made. To the potential person that predicted Nintendo would port Go Vacation to the Switch when the system was first revealed, you have my respect. I think this was an effective nail in the coffin to a potential Wii Sports follow-up by Nintendo on the Switch. It seems like they're more interested in just publishing games from other companies that appeal to that more casual demographic rather than making the game themselves. Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2. <laughs> oh yeah, it's great to have some of these games on Switch, but it is incredibly annoying that they're separated via two volumes. I got it with the original Mega Man Legacy Collections. Those were created years apart, so while it was irritating that they didn't combine them for the Switch release, it still kind of made sense. The X Legacy Collections need to go lay down. They have no excuse to be this way. They released the exact same day and are literally the same collection with the same extras, just with different games. Plus, X Legacy Collection 2 is undoubtedly the worst collection. It includes the latter half of the X series, which f***ing stinks. Well, Nintendo announced a new Labo kit, the Vehicle Kit, and everybody was kind of like, ooh, but was also kind of like, eh, we already knew what to expect from Labo at this point, so I wasn't suckered into this one as much. Warframe was announced, a port being done by Panic Button. They brought over Doom, Rocket League, Wolfenstein 2, these guys are wizards. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe randomly got a new update where Link can wear his Breath of the Wild attire, nice. But why? 2K announced that WWE 2K19 wouldn't be on the Switch this year, uh, definitely because WWE 2K18 was f***ing garbage on the Switch. Like, yeah, no wonder the series doesn't sell well on the platform. Nintendo also made a statement that they like to release 20 to 30 indie games every week on the eShop. 
All right, guys, the Nintendo Switch eShop has officially become a breeding ground for pure garbage. Literally anybody can release a game on the Switch eShop. It's so bad. Releasing that many games a week isn't a good thing, Nintendo. I haven't been playing as many indie games on the Switch as I was back in 2017 because there's like a dozen that release every day. I can't keep up with them. And for every good one, there's four fucking Calculation Castle games. Now, August was automatically great because we got a Smash Brothers Ultimate Direct on August 8th. This was way better than E3. The reveals of Simon and Richter Belmont, all the stages, King K ruled, there were no negatives with this direct in my opinion. It was just pure Smash Brothers for 30 minutes. Just like E3, but at least with this direct, it was completely warranted to be just Smash Brothers. Dead Cells was the hot indie game of the month on Switch. It was apparently so good it's worth losing your job over. I didn't pick this one up just yet, but I did buy Okami HD and oh, it's so beautiful. It's such a good game, but hell yeah, Picross S2. More Picross, man. It's so good. It's so Picross. Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate Overcooked 2, a pretty quiet yet solid month for games. Not a ton of stuff overall, but a good amount of great titles. And Night Trap. There was another Nindies presentation, a bit longer than the last one, but nothing really stood out to me outside of Untitled Goose Game. They revealed Into the Breach at the end, which I know was made by the same guys behind FTL, but it didn't really excite me at all, to be honest. Diablo 3 was officially announced after being rumored for months. I mean, that's cool that Blizzard is back publishing games on Nintendo platforms, but man, Overwatch would have been such a better fit and would have been so much cooler to see. Doom Eternal's gameplay was shown off and it was announced the game would be coming simultaneously to everything, including Nintendo Switch. That was awesome. It was great to see a modern game get announced for Switch day and date with the other versions, and they didn't make a huge deal about it. It was like it was just one of the other consoles. But brace yourself, folks, because development on Steep for Nintendo Switch was officially halted. No. This game was shown off in the original January 2017 presentation, and then they never really said anything about it for a year and a half, and now they'll really never say anything about it. September 2018 was my favorite month to hate Nintendo Switch Online, but first, a Nintendo Direct premiered on September 13th after being delayed from a September 6th date after a tragic earthquake in Japan. That was perfectly fine waiting, especially considering the circumstances, and it was well worth the wait. This was a pretty decent Direct. Uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 was revealed right off the bat, and it looked okay. Uh, one of the things that makes Luigi's Mansion so memorable for people is the atmosphere and overall aesthetic. People mega dig the family-friendly yet still a little creepy, unnerving haunted house look. And the original nailed that. Uh, but with Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon and 3, it doesn't look dark enough and the aesthetic feels more like haunted house clip art to me. I don't know, not saying it looks bad, it just looks okay so far. I need to see more. New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe was announced and somebody was probably happy. This was a port I would have never guessed they would do a year ago. It just didn't make any sense. Why not just barf out a new New Super Mario Bros. game? Come on, they can't take that many resources. But hey, if getting a port of the Wii U's New Super Mario means we aren't getting a brand new one and Nintendo's teams can work on way better games, I'm okay with it. Civilization VI was supposed to be announced in the Direct, but due to the delay, it was revealed beforehand and the Direct acted like it was a big surprise. I guess this was supposed to be the big third-party game we weren't expecting for 2018, like how Doom was for 2017. But I don't know, it's cool that it was announced, but it wasn't jaw-dropping or anything. The Yoshi title from last year's E3 got a final name, Yoshi's Crafted World, and was slated for spring. The Game Freak showed off a new RPG called Town, a remake of the original Katamari Damacy, and non-stop Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy XV Pocket Edition HD, a port of a mobile version of Final Fantasy XV. That's all we're getting Final Fantasy XV related, isn't it? I mean, look at XV. You really think they could make that work on Switch immediately? It would have to be a substantial project to port that original game over. And the original consoles also got Pocket Edition HD, so it doesn't feel that lame. Like, they got it too. It wasn't like they just did this for Switch. But, uh, no, this wasn't the greatest news. This was the lamest possible outcome of getting Final Fantasy XV on Switch. But hey, at least they announced Crystal Chronicles HD, Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, Final Fantasy XII, 10, 10, 2, 9, and 7. They're actually bringing 7 to the Switch. The became famous for not being a Nintendo game. Now, that is pretty historic. Smash Brothers Ultimate got a bundle. I thought the dock looked pretty good, but those Joy-Con, man, right Joy-Con fans? I'm sorry. It came out a month before the game officially did, and came with a code for Smash Brothers, which unlocked on December 7th. The November release was a bit odd. I guess they wanted to get it out before Black Friday. Then they announced Isabel for Smash Brothers, and that led into a tease for Animal Crossing on the Switch in 2019. They didn't show anything, but hey, what are you gonna do? Xenoblade 2 Torna the Golden Country was the main Nintendo title published this month. While it was DLC for the original Xenoblade 2, you could purchase a physical copy by itself for 40 bucks. It had a new battle system and basically could be considered a new game, which is pretty cool. 
Yeah, I didn't buy it. I did play a fair amount of the Capcom beat em up bundle, but beat em ups aren't nearly as fun on console because you can just infinitely play a game. You don't need to keep pumping quarters into an arcade machine, so I flew through Final Fight in an hour by just mashing buttons and not thinking at all. These games are way more fun in the arcade environment, but it was still nice to have a good amount of Capcom's legacy playable on Switch. Sega Ages games finally released, starting things off with Sonic 1 and Lightning Force Quest for the Dark Star right after the Sega Genesis Classics collection was announced for Switch. Sega, what the hell were you thinking? Right before you tried to sell a copy of Sonic 1 for $8, you announced a collection of like 53 Genesis games, including Sonic 1 for only 30 bucks? Yeah, I did pick up Lightning Force because it wasn't in that collection and it ran pretty well. There's a lot of options in these Sega Ages releases. They're structurally pretty great, but I am not paying eight bucks for Sonic 1 when I can just get that collection. Labo Vehicle Kit release and what do you know, barely anybody talked about it. I think we might be in for one more Labo Kit, maybe two, but. I don't think it's going too far past that, unfortunately. Scribblenauts redeemed themselves after Showdown by releasing the Mega Pack featuring Scribblenauts Unlimited and Unmasked. A Dragon Ball Fighter Z finally came out for the platform. Undertale, Valkyria Chronicles 4, South Park The Stick of Truth, Wander Song, NBA 2K19. This was a really good month for third party and indie games. But hey, you look like you want to play Assassin's Creed Odyssey Cloud version on your Switch. Did it really give off that vibe? Yep, same deal as Resident Evil 4. It would launch alongside the other consoles in Japan only. Nice. But we gotta get down to what September was really known for. <gasps> Nintendo Switch Online officially launched and people were not happy. It basically felt like all they did was push a button and made us pay for online multiplayer. Nothing really improved, it was the same old thing we were getting for free since launch. The cloud saves were nice, but titles like Splatoon 2 and Pokemon didn't work with them to stop cheating. Who cares? These are games that people would actually want cloud saves for. Games people spend hundreds of hours in, they don't want to lose their progress. Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo Switch Online, rolls right off the tongue. This is a service offered free to online members where you can play a selection of NES titles. 20 games were available at launch, 2-3 to three added each month after that. This was the replacement for Virtual Console, with that you just buy whatever old games you want. Here it's set up more like a subscription service where you can just open up the app and pick any game you want to play. Now this whole setup is kind of what a lot of people suggested for the Virtual Console to evolve, but for this to work well, there needs to be more than a couple dozen games. Why is this thing locked behind the online membership? Do you really think half the people who play Splatoon 2 online give a piss about baseball on NES? The game selection at launch was rough. Sure, I was happy to see they offered some third party NES games and we got games like Mario 3, but this library was what I feared the NES Classic Edition would have. When that thing was announced to have 30 NES games, I was like, ah, oh, great, I can't wait to play Urban Champion in tennis. But no, they did a legitimately great job piecing together 30 of the greatest, most iconic NES games of all time. For Nintendo Switch Online, Nintendo had no problem throwing pro wrestling and soccer onto the service. Seriously, these garbage early black box NES games make up a good chunk of the games offered. It's gross. You play these games for five minutes and you never have to play them again. Now, in terms of playing the games, they run and look pretty great. Hopping from game to game is instantaneous. Uh, online multiplayer is offered across all games and it works all right. But it is annoying how you can't remap any buttons or turn off this control layout or turn off or change this border if only it was blue or just purchase any of these games separately outside of the app. If you want to play Kirby's Adventure on your Switch, you have to subscribe to the online service. Why can't I just buy it for five bucks on the eShop? Nintendo would make more money that way. This is a fine way to play NES games. They load crazy fast and there's a decent selection now. But man, is it hard to get excited about NES games nowadays. Nintendo's been drip feeding us NES games over the years on other platforms and now they're doing it again with the Switch. They had a bunch of filler here too with these special releases of games where it's literally just a save state later in the title. I'm sure since this is basically a subscription service, that makes adding new games so much slower than it would be to just offer them all separately on the eShop. Like instead of just asking Capcom if they could put Mega Man 2 out through the virtual console on the eShop, Nintendo definitely has to pay them something up front or Capcom will get a certain percentage of money from the online membership subscriptions or whatever. I think throwing a game on the eShop is way easier to do for most companies, even Nintendo. This is just making things more complicated for everybody, and because of that, we get less NES games than we ever did on older virtual console services. Seriously, Nintendo, two NES games per month? You would release two NES games per week on the Wii U sometimes. But hey, at least with this service, if we pay for Nintendo Switch Online, Nintendo gives us the right to buy NES controllers for the Switch, $60. That is a little high for NES controllers, I must admit. I'd rather be able to buy the NES games I want to own on the eShop and have this service as an option outside of Nintendo Switch Online. The service is only 20 bucks a year, which is totally manageable by most people. 
but instead of making a great service for 60 bucks a year, Nintendo opted to make a mediocre one for 20. It was just so annoying that this was what we got after waiting a year for Nintendo Switch Online. They always kept saying, we'll have more to reveal about this service later. If Nintendo delayed the service just to get the online multiplayer for NES games working right, oh god. If a billion dollar company had problems getting NES games to run online, we're f***ed as a society. Dark Souls Remastered finally released in summer of 2018, if you count October as summer. But the game I was more intrigued by this month was Super Mario Party. Super Mario Party proved that ND Cube knew what people wanted from Mario Party, but really didn't know what people wanted from Mario Party. Compared to recent Mario Party titles that were just the definition of not very, very good, Super Mario Party reverts to the formula of the first eight titles, and that definitely makes things super tolerable. This is a fun multiplayer game, but it is nowhere near as good as the height of the N64 and GameCube Mario Parties. It feels like they went for quantity over quality when it came to the modes in this game. There are a ton of things to do here, but each and every one of them is gimped, there's just not enough to them. There are only four boards in the standard Mario Party mode, I'm sorry, but that is unacceptable. Even worse is the fact that each board is grid-based, they just don't have the most interesting layouts, plus they're really small. There aren't enough different pathways for you to go on, and most of the time there's a path that is undeniably the best one to go on, so really in the end each board just kind of feels like you and your friends are constantly going around in circles with how small, simple, and undeveloped the boards are. Also, this game just has so many things that are unbalanced about it. Now, have the fun of Mario Party is the fact that a lot of things are luck based. I'm not talking about that. The main goal in a standard Mario Party game is to get as many stars as possible, which you primarily get by collecting and spending the coins you earn from playing mini games and landing on good spaces. But you get so many coins in this game that they lose so much value. Stars are so cheap to buy, like who cares if you lose coins? And that's a major problem. There needs to be weight to the things going on. Now the mini games are perfectly fine, and while the boards are a step in the right direction compared to Mario Party 9 and 10, they definitely needed more of them, and the boards themselves need to be of higher quality. The other modes in Super Mario Party are kinda cool, only the first time around. River Survival is fun, you have to travel down a stream with your friends cooperating to win minigames to gain more time on the clock. It's actually a really fun idea, but there's only 10 different minigames that can appear in this mode. They're gonna repeat fairly often. Also, it's way too easy. Maybe if they started you off with less time, it would be better. But overall, this was just a mode that was a good idea, but kind of ruined with the execution. They got so much right with the concepts in Super Mario Party, but in the end, they just needed more game boards and better ones at that. Or they just needed to put more effort into all the modes. Every single one of them is lacking in some way. It's still definitely a fun time with friends, but honestly, after I've seen everything this one has to offer, I'd rather just play the GameCube games from now on with my friends. Now I know, not everybody has access to the older Mario Party, so for them, Super Mario Party is perfectly fine. It does the job of supplying a fun enough new Mario Party. It just could have been so much better. I'm really hoping for a Super Mario Party 2 with better and more boards, or more of a focus on quality over quantity with modes. The World Ends With You Final Remix, a remaster of the DS title for 50 bucks. That was a little steep, and from what I've heard, this really isn't one of the best consoles to play World Ends With You on. Playing in handheld mode seems okay, but playing on the TV, it really doesn't work well. This game definitely requires a touchscreen, which makes me think this remaster would have worked a lot better if it was released a few years ago on the Wii U. Dark Souls Remastered finally came out, and after playing it, I don't think I'm a Dark Souls guy. All those delays for nothing. It didn't grab me immediately. I'll definitely try it again for sure, but I don't think it's the game for me. But really though, it's great to see this game on Switch, but all those delays were kind of ridiculous. Starlink released, and reception was a bit mixed. I wasn't really interested, but it seemed like people either loved the game or found it really boring. Regardless, the Switch version was the only one that did somewhat okay, definitely due to the Star Fox content. But this game really didn't sell well overall. It was put on sale almost immediately after releasing. Mega Man 11, though, did fairly well, and I really enjoyed it. It controlled like a dream and has a great look to it. The music was pretty lame by Mega Man standards, and I wish there were more checkpoints. These stages are long, and dying somewhat far into one and having Having to traverse five minutes of the stage again isn't fun. Other than that, this was a solid return to form for Mega Man, and the new double gear mechanic where you can slow down time or power Mega Man up for a brief moment was awesome. I hope for future games they get a little riskier and try more new things like this with the series. Eleven did feel pretty vanilla Mega Man overall. Still really good though. Guacamelee, Child of Light, The Original Valkyria Chronicles, Windjammers, October was pretty decent overall. Definitely something for everybody here. Now November's big title was Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, the first main Pokemon game I ever owned and played, and I'm sorry, but this game was kind of boring. It was obviously made for people like me, or people who fell out of Pokemon, or Pokemon Go fans. But it was just too simple. There was nothing that kept me engaged. I wasn't like, oh man, I gotta keep playing. It felt too basic, probably due to the fact that it was a pretty faithful remake of a Game Boy game. 
I've seen a lot of people praise Let's Go for trimming the fat of the newer Pokemon games and keeping things simple. But I don't know, man. I think they took it a little too far, and I really lost interest fairly quickly. I think for a Pokemon game to really grab me, it has to be more in-depth than Let's Go, but simpler than the newer games. I'm in Pokemon Purgatory. Also, can we talk about how this game requires you to use one Joy-Con and motion controls in TV mode? There's no reason for doing this. You can play with a standard button layout with no motion controls in handheld mode. Why can't I just use a Pro Controller on the TV? November was a big month for the third parties. We got Diablo 3, Civ 6, Warframe, and Ark. Nice port, guys! I was surprised to see Miss Explosion Man release on Switch. It was originally a Microsoft published game for 360, but I guess the developer parted ways with them and we got Explosion Man for Switch now. F in Carnival Games, guys, it's back! The Wii sensation made its way to Switch, and Jesus Christ, you see, I think you could get away with graphics like these on the Wii, but here even I'm embarrassed with how this looks. The final Smash Brothers Ultimate Direct debuted on November 1st, and it wasn't that great. The announcements were pretty subpar overall, and just felt like they already revealed all the cool stuff, and had like a bunch of really small whatever things to talk about, and they just spread it across 40 minutes. The game still looked great though, it just was a bit of an underwhelming way to end off the announcements. There was a rumor floating around that Eiji Onuma apparently hinted at a Skyward Sword HD remaster at a Zelda concert in Japan, and even though Nintendo made a statement saying, yeah, it's not happening, I mean, it's probably happening. Why else would Anuma say that? Now, I picked up a ton of games over Black Friday. I got a box copy of Bayonetta 2 on the Switch for like 30 bucks, but I also went berserk on the eShop. I finally got Doom, Child of Light, Undertale, Sonic Forces for some fucking reason. All those board game and game show games from Ubisoft were on sale, so why not? Yeah, Smash Brothers came out this month. Let's talk about that. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate single-handedly turned a pretty lame year for first-party Nintendo releases into a pretty lame year for first-party Nintendo releases that at least ended with a really good Smash Brothers. And that's all I really say whenever somebody asks what I think about Smash Brothers Ultimate. It's a really good Smash Brothers. The gameplay is better than it's ever been. Oh my god, these visuals are so good. The soundtrack goes on for centuries. The character roster and stage list are mind-boggling. There are still stages in this game that'll pop up and I'll go, oh man, this stage is in the game, I forgot. It is a great game to put it lightly. However, its single player offerings aren't the greatest in the world, and the fact that some Smash Brothers staples were cut entirely is a bit puzzling. Ultimate single player lacks a lot of variety, while the classic mode is really cool this time, featuring character specific routes for each fighter, it adds to the fact that single player wise, it's basically non stop spirit battles. Ultimate features these collectibles called Spirits, over a thousand pieces of character art from other games. They're the basis of spirit battles, which take a character in a specific costume or color on a specific stage with specific conditions that are supposed to invoke the spirit of the character it's representing. These are the basis for the mode World of Light, which is fundamentally just roaming around on a JPEG fighting spirits. These are all new things that are meant to replace various Smash Brothers staples from the past trophies, events, and the adventure mode. However, they all just just feel a bit underwhelming. Spirits are just images, and compared to trophies, which were full 3D models and had descriptions and told you up to two different games that character was from, yeah, they're pretty lackluster in comparison. Spirit paddles are crazy charming at first, but they lose their luster after a while considering there's over a thousand of them. Plus, half the charm of a spirit battle comes from understanding what they're referencing, and if you don't know the character, it's hard to appreciate the spirit battle, which is a problem considering none of the spirits have descriptions of any character information like trophies did. And then the adventure mode, World of Light. It's fine, it does the job, but goes on far too long. But now I have to ask, where are all the things from previous Smash games, like Home Run Contest? It's a little weird they're not here considering so many of the things missing from Ultimate were present in Smash for Wii U. And Ultimate was built off of Smash Wii U, so it doesn't seem like these things would be hard at all to bring over into Ultimate. Now most of these complaints are honestly nitpicks. I'm still playing Spirit Battles in Smash Ultimate, I 100%ed World of Light, not because I was over the moon in love with these things, I just really like Smash Ultimate, and these things, while not the most fun things in the world, were fun enough to play in short bursts. I found myself playing 30 minutes of World of Light before bed to feel I accomplished something that day. One of the most negative things I can say about a game are just, yeah, this part about the game is a little mediocre, but not bad or anything, and everything else is pretty spot on, that's when you know it's a good game. However, I do have to say, with this match happening so quickly after the last one, I didn't have the same excitement I had for Brawl or Smash for 3DS and Wii U when they came out. I feel like myself and countless others were asking for Smash for Switch not because we were tying for a new Smash game, but because we literally just wanted to play Smash Brothers on the Switch. A year or so ago, I would have been perfectly happy with an enhanced Smash for Wii U port. And to see we got Ultimate, I'm more than happy with this, even if I do have some nitpicks here and there. On the same day as Smash Brothers, Katamari Damacy Reroll and Sega Genesis Classics came out. That was a mistake. Katamari Reroll is fantastic. Just the same old Katamari Damacy from the PlayStation 2, but now in beautiful HD. I love it. How it was hard to find a physical copy of this game. I believe it was a GameStop exclusive, and I didn't know that until after copies were selling for crazy amounts of cash. But thankfully, they restocked it, and it's hanging out on my game shelf now. Sega Genesis Classics is a great deal for only 30 bucks. 
I'm not a fan of the overall menu aesthetic, it looks really cheap to me, but other than that, it has a great selection of titles for a great price. Uh, no Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Echo the Dolphin though, so nowhere near the ultimate collection, but still a no-brainer for 30 bucks. Gotta be honest, not a ton of other notable titles came out in December, but hey, we got four gallons of announcements at the Game Awards this year. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 was announced as a Nintendo Switch exclusive published by Nintendo and developed by Team Ninja. I know these games have a fan base, but this was an odd game series for Nintendo to revive. Joker from Persona 5 was announced as a DLC character for Smash Bros. Ultimate. Yeah, that means Persona 5 is coming to Switch. It hasn't been announced yet, but yeah, that means Persona 5 is coming to Switch. Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled and Mortal Kombat 11 were announced as multi-platform Switch titles. Uh, CTR I totally get, but Mortal Kombat 11? Nobody expected that. They showed the trailer at the Game Awards, and I don't think anybody was saying, yeah, it's coming to Switch, but no, it is. There's a logo and everything. There were lots of rumors about the Metroid Prime Trilogy coming to Switch and being unveiled at the Game Awards, but that never happened. Oh, I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll unveil it alongside new information on Metroid Prime 4. That was uncalled for. After being announced at E3 2017 and nothing else, Nintendo announced they were not pleased with the development status of Prime 4 and decided to restart the project, now being developed by Retro Studios, the original studio behind the Prime Trilogy. Now, a lot of people were upset about this this, and I totally understand, but honestly, I was pretty okay with this overall. First off, we knew nothing about Metroid Prime 4 other than some jank logo. Hearing that the game we knew nothing about was still coming, it was just being restarted, didn't really bother me because, you know, we knew nothing about it. The rumors were that various segments of Bandai Namco were working on the game, and I felt Bandai Namco could probably be trusted with Metroid Prime, but I have way more faith in Retro. Sure, the original team that made Metroid Prime is long gone, but Retro still makes really good games. I don't have any worries concerning Prime 4. Many were expecting a Nintendo Direct for January, but that never happened. We got random spurts of information like Yoshi's Crafted World's release date and an indie showcase on Nintendo UK's YouTube channel, but that was about it. Really though, who cares, because New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe release still f I played enough New Super Mario Bros. U, I didn't want to contract anything again, so I haven't picked this one up. If anything, this version is worse than the Wii U release. Later releases of the game already included all the DLC, plus it had Boost Mode, which relied on the Wii U gamepad and challenges associated with it. They took all that out and they added Toadette as a playable character, but with that they made it so that if you're playing 4 player multiplayer, one player will have an advantage because Toadette and Nabbit have special abilities. You can't play as just Mario, Luigi, Blue, and Yellow Toad all together anymore, you're either Blue or Yellow Toad, and then the fourth player is Toadette or Nabbit. That's dumb. Also, just reading this title gives me a hernia. Nintendo also published Fitness Boxing, another sign that we ain't getting a new Wii Fit style game from them. They just published some developer's fitness game, but apparently this is a huge hit in Japan. I gave the demo a whirl, and it does offer a decent workout. Wii Fit games are more fun, but if you're looking for a fitness game, this one is fun enough and will get your arms squealing. Travis Strikes Again No More Heroes finally released, and it really wasn't what a lot of No More Heroes fans wanted. It was basically a top-down hack and slash, and a lot of the No More Heroes charm is lost by getting rid of the third-person perspective. Yeah, it wasn't the craziest month. The lack of a direct was really depressing, just because what else were Nintendo fans expected to talk about? New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe? Ah! Holy sh! All right, we're here, the last month, and it was a pretty packed one for news. A direct finally happened on February 13th, and that thing started and ended great. Super Mario Maker 2 opened the show up, and I don't think anybody could come up with anything negative to say about this. It did everything I wanted for a Mario Maker sequel. Beautiful. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening ended the show, a full remake of the Game Boy game. I'm a little worried this may be like let's go and be a little too simple considering the world map is from a Game Boy game, so you know, everything's based on a grid. But I'm not too worried, it looks fantastic so far. And everything else in the direct kinda reeked. The middle was just filled with games that did not interest me all too much, a lot of RPGs I wasn't into and just plain bad looking ports. Rune Factory 4 Special was stated to be fully remastered. What? Dead by Daylight and Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered looked rough. Like, why did they look this bad? Uh, for some reason, Hellblade is coming to the Switch? I mean, cool? Astro Train was a new Platinum Games exclusive title, which looked fine, but man, I think that name is kinda dumb. Captain Toad is getting DLC. Why? Just make a sequel. A new box boy, and they literally played a four minute long trailer for Dragon Quest XI. I get it, Nintendo wants to push Dragon Quest. This is the definitive edition. It looks great on the system, but could cut four minutes for a game that released last year? But all was saved by the announcement that a free game was coming after the Direct. Tetris 99. You against 98 other people playing Tetris. There's not much to this game, it's just Tetris with 99 players, but it is such a fun pick up and play game. Plus it was free. Finally, a reason to get Nintendo Switch online. There were loads of rumors going around that Microsoft was planning various Xbox games, Xbox Live, and Xbox Game Pass for the Switch. And if that's true, which it probably is, 
Oh my god, that will be amazing! Just so many more games on the Switch, including games I would have never pictured playing on a Nintendo console. This is so cool! Later in February, Pokemon Sword and Shield were unveiled, the true Pokemon games to be released in late 2019. I mean, they're Pokemon games, that's for sure. I saw a fair amount of people express disappointment with the fact that Game Freak seemingly isn't doing much to push Pokemon in a new direction. But I mean, Sword and Shield look like perfectly fine new Pokemon games overall, just nothing crazy. They do look like HD 3DS games. I think they look pretty good visually overall, but there's obviously areas that could use a lot of improvement, and graphically, it doesn't look mind-blowing or anything. Well, that took about four years off my life, but we finally got through the Switch's second year on the market, and overall, I hate Nintendo. Really, though, the best way to describe this year was disappointing. 2018 was just not the greatest follow-up year to 2017. This felt like such a filler year in terms of Nintendo's offerings. I mean, really, think about it. How many in-house Nintendo-made games came out? Like, other than Labo and older games... Nothing really, they just published second and third party titles. They obviously just rode this year out and banked on Pokemon and Smash Brothers to save it, and they were completely right because they did. While I love Smash Brothers Ultimate, and throughout the year the upcoming release of the game made things interesting, the year itself was pretty lackluster overall. I feel like Nintendo used 2018 to quietly work on a lot of future games because it's obvious 2019 is going to be filled with a lot more heavy hitting first party titles. Mario Maker 2, Animal Crossing, Link's Awakening, there's so much coming. 2019 feels exactly how 2013 felt for the 3DS games wise, and that was one of the handheld's best years. Luigi's Mansion, Pokemon, 2D Zelda, Animal Crossing, Fire Emblem, even little eShop titles. All games the Switch has coming in 2019 that the 3DS had in 2013. I'm pretty stoked. But still, in terms of last year, Nintendo's support for 2018 was, in one word, underwhelming. To me, each of their big new games were either unfinished at launch, just plain lacking in content, or underwhelming. Sure, we got a lot of the Wii U's greatest hits, but those are old games. I already played them. Now, of course, I don't speak for the people who never played games like Tropical Freeze or Captain Toad and were able to play them for the first time. They're great games. They deserve to be played by everybody. But they're also old ones for a lot of people, including me. I still like ports on the Switch, but I want them to supplement new games coming out, not fully replace them. And ports are fundamentally 90% of the Switch's library. Don't get me wrong, I want every game ever made on the Switch too. It's incredibly convenient to have so many games from different kinds of consoles and time periods on an all-in-one portable home console. There's always something to play on this system, but the fact that the vast, vast majority of this library is old makes the system less exciting sometimes. It gives the system less character since it's primarily characterized by titles that it can't call its own, which is weird to say about a Nintendo system. Like I said, I like having these ports and older games on the Switch, but that's almost all that comes to the system. I want to see more new original titles released for it, both from Nintendo and third parties. Well, with Nintendo, they're almost out of Wii U games to port over, and thinking about some of the games they have left, I think Mario 3D World will make the jump. This game would feel way more at home on the Switch than it did on the Wii U, especially with the two Joy-Con, instant co-op multiplayer. I'd be more than okay with the Paper Mario Color Splash port, just because ditching the Wii U gamepad would make this game way better. Wonderful 101 would definitely benefit from one. Uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, it would be nice if they pulled a Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition and combined the content from the 3DS and Wii U versions. Pikmin 3 is probably gonna happen, I'd prefer a Pikmin HD collection though, or better yet, Pikmin 4 for God's sake. But I'd prefer much older games remastered compared to Wii U ports. I just played a lot of these games a few years ago, why not remaster some much older titles? Obviously because that would be a lot more work, but still, I would rather see some remasters. Of course, you may say, with all this old game talk, but Scott, there are loads of original games on the Switch. Not everything's a port or an old game. Well, yeah, there has to be some great original games, but I can't find them in this minefield of shovelware. The Nintendo Switch eShop is horrendous. Every time I log on, it lags and stutters more and more because too many games are releasing on it. Now, that must be a good thing, right? No, of course not. Most of these games nobody has ever heard of and nobody wants to play. I think this is just porn. The eShop desperately needs an overhaul. Nintendo added this featured tab, but it doesn't really do a a good job highlighting games you might not have heard of. It mainly just showcases games we all know are on the system. Speaking of the eShop, I already said this last year, but I really wish Nintendo would put out more smaller games on there like they used to do on the 3DS. Just throw out random things on there like Pushmo or another
other snipper clips, or better yet, completely original games. That would have definitely helped things out when there wasn't a ton coming out I was itching to play. I feel like Sushi Striker would have been the perfect kind of eShop game, but unlike Pushmo or Snipper Clips, which were downloadable titles at a low price, Sushi Striker came out of retail for 50 bucks, and that's a major problem in general with Switch content. There has rarely been a great deal when it comes to Switch accessories or games. This has been a thing since launch, but it's been especially noticeable this year when something like Kirby Star Allies comes out for $60. When Kirby Planet Robobot for the 3DS came out a few years ago for $40 and had more content. Capcom recently revealed that Resident Evil 1, 0, and 4 would cost $30 dollars each when they cost 20 on the PS4 and Xbox One. Why? I guess publishers are pricing Switch related items crazy high just because they know they can and it's just ridiculous. I've recently started playing Resident Evil 4 and I adore it. I was gonna buy the Switch version on release but I guess I'll just wait for a sale now. I do quite enjoy the Switch, and while I finally remember and somewhat miss the days of 2017 when we only got 20 games a month, albeit good games, I'm happy that it's been this monumental of a success. I want to see it succeed and become better, which is why I'm very critical of it right now. This isn't the charming little console that could from 2017 anymore. This is a legitimate platform with thousands of games ranging from retro to indie to AAA releases, which makes the problems that are still here after they could have been fixed since launch that much more irritating. We're still waiting for a better eShop experience, a much better online service, more new original games from third parties, a better lineup of legacy content from Nintendo, a more robust operating system for God's sakes, this whole we're focusing on games at launch was cute, but it's been two years, Nintendo. This is ridiculous. No internet browser, no way to browse social media. You can post to it, but not browse it. No menu themes, no folders, still no Netflix. Oh my God. I want the Switch to be the best console it can possibly be. So when Nintendo does something that I find underwhelming or just plain bad, I'm gonna talk about it in a tone that'll make any grandmother faint. I didn't personally find 2018 that crazy exciting on the games front, but that doesn't mean the system is bad, far from it. The last year was sort of lackluster for me, but 2019 is looking to definitely be an improvement, and I am legitimately excited for the future of this console. The Nintendo Switch has potential to be one of the greatest systems of all time. It just needs to fix a few things. The eShop needs a better design, the overall quality of the online service needs to be improved, the releases of newer and older titles should be much more evened out, needs to refrigerate food better, kill 99.9% .9 of germs, eat my vegetables, tell me ghost stories, drive my cousin to school, and if it does all that, then I think we have a winner on our hands.